Hey everyone, welcome to today's AMA. I am super excited to have you with us today. My name is Hannah Abaza. I'm the head of marketing at Shopify Plus. And today I'm super pumped to have with me Chase Fisher, who is the founder of Blender's Eyewear. Hey Chase. What's going on guys, how you doing? <laughs> so I'm so pumped today because we have so many amazing questions for Chase, um, really crowdsourced by all of you guys. So um, when you registered for the webinar, you had the opportunity to put in a question and there were so many great questions. So we're going to dive right in in a moment. But before we do that, uh, we are actually going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so a couple things to remember as we go through this. Number one, um, we are going to first go through the list of questions that people submitted as they were registering. I'm gonna try and keep some time at the end for some live Q&A. So if you guys start to think of questions that you wanna ask as Chase and I are chatting, definitely dump them into the question box. We'll try and circle back on as many as possible. Um, I have a feeling we are going to run out of time as we usually do, um, but definitely ask uh, all of those burning questions that you might have. And uh, other piece of housekeeping is keep your eye out on your inbox in the next day or two because we will send out a follow-up recording as well as a link to any resources that we might mention um, that can help you guys out as you grow your business. Uh, and then of course, feel free to share that recording off with your uh, colleagues um, to also kind of spread the word and, and give them access to this great content. Uh, so without further ado, we're gonna dive right in because we have a lot of stuff to dig into. Um, Chase, I'd love for you to start with a um, just a little bit of a background on you and also maybe tell us a little bit about blenders definitely so I'm from Santa Barbara and I'm currently 30 now and I was a, a very you know competitive surfer athlete grew up grew up a lot around a lot of brands and um, I just kind of fell in love with branding at a really young age and uh, was sponsored and stuff like that and moved down to San Diego to kind of pursue college and I was on the surf team down here and um, San Diego to me was just a much bigger area to really kind of like pursue all my passions and things I love to do and and stuff. So when I graduated in 2000, 2010, about a year and a half after that, I actually went to a nightclub to see one of my favorite DJs. And every time this DJ comes into town, I'm always there and I'm the first guy in line and the last one to leave. And, and so I wanted something to kind of add to my outfit. And so for some reason, I went to I went to Target and the first thing I saw was a pair of neon green sunglasses. And I bought them for five bucks and wore them out to the club. Everyone in the club was like, whoa, where'd you get those? Those are so cool. Like, let me try them on. And there was all this buzz around my sunglasses when I was just out with my friends. And so kind of went home that night and just became like obsessed with sunglasses and started kind of like resonating with me about like, wow, there's a lot of attention around them. And I'm the kind of guy when I get into something, like I, I really get into it. And so I remember just sitting on the boardwalk watching people walk by here in San Diego and just kind of noticing their sunglasses and just seeing that they were either wearing the same ones I was wearing, the $5 beaters on the, you know, that, that you could buy at the beach or Target or your $200 Gucci's, Ray-Bans or Oakley's. And there wasn't a price, you know, a product or a brand in between that really resonated with millennials and that was cool and that was reflective of our lifestyle in San Diego. So not only was there a need for it, but I figured, hey, if like, I can't sell sunglasses in San Diego. This is never going to work anywhere else. So this is my shot. And so um, I just dove in head first. Didn't have any experience, but 100% confidence. I can figure it out. So, so talk to me a little bit about what that looked like. So when you guys started off, obviously, you know, it was a small, like small startup. You were trying to figure out things like funding and, you know, how do we get off the ground? How do we fund this thing? Can you talk a little bit about what some of those challenges were at the beginning? Um, and then like, we'll kind of come full circle. And now that you guys have scaled and you're in like hyper growth, what some of the challenges are now? Totally. So when, when we first started, like obviously we had zero dollars and I had the idea and I needed help kind of putting it on paper. So um, my business partner was actually my neighbor and, and I didn't even know him. And he was a graphic designer at, at the time. And so um, we lived on a street called Hornblend, which is why we called it blenders and mixing and matching of colors. And so he helped me kind of craft the idea and put it on paper. And we both kind of jumped in the saddle head first and, uh, you know, didn't really know what we were doing, to be honest. We just kind of like put, put up designs on Facebook. We just started kind of going through the motions. And one thing led to another. And, and so, um, you know, we just kind of like learn by doing along the way. And, you know, that's kind of how we got started. So we started literally from from nothing. And um, it's been a it's been a wild experience, to say the least. <laughs> um, how has your um, like how has your strategy changed from a 
not strategy, I suppose, how have your operations changed in terms of uh, like what you were focused on then and what some of the bigger challenges are now? Because, I mean, we were talking about this earlier. Uh, a lot of times uh, you read about these really successful companies like yours and it feels like an overnight success, right? Um, and people don't dig into the stuff that's actually really, really hard. Uh, so what are some of the things that are really sort of challenging now and keeping up at night and those, those real challenges that come with scale and growth? Totally. So I think it goes back to just like your overall mission and what you're trying to do. And I think everyone nowadays is looking for that grand slam, looking for the home run, looking to, you know, buy it, buy a, or, you know, buy, buy a product and sell it on Shopify and just immediately start winning. And, and it's just, that's not the right mentality. And what, what really happens is you kind of burn yourself out and you're always searching for that unicorn and that unicorn doesn't exist. And so we know because I've, I've been down that road many times and what it is, it's just a lot of it's a lot of mastering the day to day, and it's a lot of going through the motions, and, a, and it's a lot of learning by doing. And so the strategy at the beginning is just like, how do we get this thing? How do we get eyeballs on this thing? How do we get people to hear about this thing? And just really utilizing your network. And you know, my network here in San Diego was fairly large from college and from surfing. I learned how to self market myself, and I would literally just go to the beach, and I was a surf instructor at the time, being able to. Uh, you know, sell, sell shades to my clients I would give lessons to. And my business partner was a kayak instructor. So he did the same and um, just mm -hmm. literally one pair at a time. And those types of focuses, those types of humble beginnings, those types of learning what works and what doesn't work was a huge kind of process at the beginning stages. And it's a lot of just throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks. And once you start gaining traction, then your focus starts to going into more of like, how do we build a foundation? How do we, how do we support, the operation behind this how do we turn this into an actual business not just like a lemonade stand on the street and so that's probably the biggest challenge as opposed to when you're just starting out to when you actually are trying to scale is yeah. your mindset changes from okay how do we get you know how do we hire employees how do we ship international how do we um you know be able to sustain and you know satisfy our customers on a mass level so everything is just at scale and it's 10 times harder and so mm -hmm. that's what Right up for, but that's that's part of the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I so I think that's actually going to be sort of um, a thing that comes up as we talk about all of these different areas. So we have, I mean, so much to dig into here. Everything from email marketing to how you think about holiday campaigns to BFCM to um, acquisition. So um, I suspect all of those things have changed pretty drastically as you thought about. Um, how you scale those things and as your company started to grow. Um, so let's start to dig into some of these things, um, but maybe before we get into the specific tactics, can you talk a little bit about how you think about differentiating your company uh, from you know, some of the other potential competitors in the market? I mean, you touched on that a little bit in that there wasn't really something for that niche, but can you talk a little bit more about how you think about that and brand and differentiation in general? Yeah, totally. So, you know, when we first started out, we had no idea, like, you know, what that gap looked like in terms of like the high end designer eyewear to the low end beach knockoffs. And so after doing a little bit more research, we, we learned that, you know, the eyewear market was heavily monopolized by one company and that mm -hmm. one company basically owned the entire, the entire industry from manufacturing to owning all the brands, to all the distribution, to all the, all the pricing and stuff. And it was heavily dominated. And the 60 minute article came out and it just shed light on the eyewear industry as a whole. And that, ended up working to our advantage because that really validated our niche and our idea in terms of that, hey, sunglasses don't need to cost 200 bucks anymore. You know, whatever you're buying on the high-end designer eyewear is, is all from the same factory. It's all the exact same stuff. The only thing that's different is really the logo. So right. for us, that was a, you know, that was a key kind of selling point, but at the same time, every eyewear brand in our price point was pulling out that card and everyone was trying to tell the same story. So yeah. it came down to who, to who told the story better and B, just being who we were. like. We are in San Diego. We're in the mecca of Southern California culture. We're being ourselves. This is um, the sunglass capital of America. And so we just ended up kind of building the brand around our favorite passions and what, what we love to do. And what we love to do was, um, you know, we love the music culture. We love the beach culture. We love surf culture. And, and so we basically just went back to being authentic. And that resonated really well with our customers just by the, the tone of voice we would use, the images we would post, you know, our social media and, and stuff like that. So um, you know, we, we ended up just kind of using that as like, if you're going to be San Diego, if you're going to be California, which every eyewear brand wants to be, mm -hmm. you know, this is actually real for us and not something that we're faking or trying to be. 
Mm, so really embrace sort of the authenticity and, and who you guys are as a brand. I love that. Um, okay, let, let's dive into some of the specifics here. Um, one of the things that I absolutely loved reading about, uh, and for those of you that read the Shopify blog, you might have come across the case study that was recently published on um, blenders talking about your last holiday campaign. Um, and one of the things you guys do really, really well is email marketing. Um, so I'd love to dig into that a little bit. Um, <laughs> we have a question from, uh, I believe it's Kelly Stewart. Kelly, if I'm mispronouncing your name, I'm sorry. Um, so her question is really around, um, for small teams with limited resources, so when you guys first started off, what would you say some of the key three to five things are to focus on for conversion and growth from an email marketing perspective? I mean, for us, like I'm speaking on behalf of literally starting from one pair at a time and one customer at a time from very yeah. limited resources as well. And I think for for consistency and overall brand lo like longevity, it's it's providing a product that solves or providing a product that solves a real problem. Making sure your product is something that people want to talk about. Making sure there's a a viral aspect to your product and also to your experience. And those two things combined, like need to be burned into your brain in the very early beginning stages because that's what's going to kind of set the pace for years to come and so being able to maximize those little things and improve your customers experience make it so good that they have to tell their customers about it is very important and so that to me is probably the number one thing i would focus on and then just streamlining your content making sure your branding and your social media and understanding how to use social media is is number two i mean today's day and age like it's the new it's the new radio it's the new tv and if you're not playing in that space you're going to get you're going to get left behind so learning learning social yeah, media yeah. is really important what um i mean what social channels do you guys tend to skew a little bit more towards i mean we're i mean so our, our paid is heavily regulated by facebook obviously like that's driving most of the most of the traffic and with facebook um, you know, when they get to on-site, then we have our, our overlays and our pop-ups, and then they kind of get implemented into our system. And so everything works in unison with each other. And if mm -hmm. one thing is broken or one thing's not set up properly, the whole thing kind of isn't maximized. And so understanding early on, like what those, what those buckets look like is really important. And that's just goes back to like setting your e-commerce funnel up, understanding what that journey looks like from a user perspective and making mm -hmm. sure you kind of check all those boxes. And, that's a deep dive and that took us a long, a long time to figure out and we're still learning a lot about it. But mm -hmm. as you scale, as you grow, as you increase your customers, setting that up properly is so important in terms of um, building your customer base. So do you think about sort of a multi-channel, I know that's kind of a buzzword and everybody talks about it, but do you like think about a multi-channel strategy when you're looking at all of this versus like one off, we have a Facebook campaign, we have an email campaign. Like, do you, do you consciously try and thread it all together? Yeah, it's tough because Facebook is literally like, I mean, it's the, the best. I mean, Facebook has built the most like robust advertising platform in the world and there's nothing that competes with it. And so we've tried a lot of different, uh, different marketing channels and different, and different things. And we just haven't seen the results that Facebook produces. So, we started seeing that as you segment your your advertising, as you segment your um, channels that you're you know pushing marketing through, the acquisition in which those attribute to all become kind of like everyone's saying that they got that one conversion. So your metrics are all thrown off. You're like, did Facebook get this? Did did Google get this? Like you don't know. And so um, when you're first starting out, you kind of become obsessed with that, and then to optimize it, you're just you're kind of always spinning your wheels. So we've just happily been focusing on what's been working the best, and that's just been Facebook and Instagram and email marketing and social media. And so for us to like diversify into another channel, it's we're definitely open to it now, but it needs to be, you know, we've we've been down a lot of those roads and, and until they get better. It's like it's it's not something that we're gonna spend time on. But at the same time, we we are one dimensional when it comes to, you know, Facebook's algorithm changes. Facebook's, you know, if whatever that might look like things things change all the time so it's it's a little bit risky too yeah yeah definitely there's a lot of moving parts when you're looking at any kind of online advertising and um it's also really tough to keep up with you know if you're using a channel when does that channel get really saturated and too costly and when you need to try other stuff um I, you touched on one thing that i just want to ask a little bit more about because we actually get a lot of questions about this um is sort of looking at your segmentation um 
how do you, how much does segmentation come into play when you're thinking about actually pulling together um, a campaign, whether it's around holidays or even just like an email campaign or a sale? Um, do you get really segmented with your existing database? Um, and does that then feed like custom audiences on Facebook or you know something along those lines? How do you how do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. So when when we first started, it was all about just master, you know, like increasing our one bucket of you know our master list, and like we didn't care who were on that list, who they were, where they're from, where those email addresses were. We just wanted to literally build that list as big as we could, and we got kind of caught up in the numbers of just building up the list. And once the list gets bigger, we're going to make more sales, and it's like that couldn't be further from the truth. And so what happens when you do that, you steer away from your customer base and your your mailing list actually becomes depreciated because those aren't customers that are actually going to buy. You're spending more money to have a list of that size and your your deliverability gets pretty much knocked out because your you know, your your percentages are all off. So we've basically taken the approach of always doing health checks on our email list and making sure we clean them up every 6 6 to 12 months to make sure like the people that we're messaging are actually that are actually engaging with the emails. And further on that, it's about it's it is about segmentation. It is about as your customer base grows, as your brand grows and your audiences grow, they shouldn't be getting the same messages as everybody else. You should segment certain messages to your VIP customers that are spending more each each year. You should be segmenting messages to differently to men and women. And so as your base grows and your demo grows, so do your segmentation and your communication lines. And each one of those communication lines does have different content. It does have different messaging. It does have different um, different ways that we communicate. And even though they are automated, it's still, because they're segmented, it allows you to personalize them a lot more. And so messages go to, you know, to men and women are completely different as opposed to someone that bought once as a, and then someone that bought 15 to 20 times. Like that message is completely different. So that's, that's very, very important. And that allows you to start focusing on on which sort of buckets provide the most value and making sure your messages that you send them are, are, are valid. Do you have an idea of um, like what the mix is um, in terms of, you know, like somebody is a repeat purchaser, um, do you have a sense of what the like lifetime value is or just general order value of those customers and how do you start to treat those types of customers um, a little bit differently? And I guess, I guess part of what I'm getting at here is um, a lot of people, particularly in e-commerce, get stuck in like a one and done. Like they bought a thing and then like they don't really do anything to sort of get them to become returning customers. And like what we see is there's generally higher value in returning customers. So totally. how do you think about that? How do you treat them differently? Yeah. So, I mean, that goes back to just your customer experience and making sure you nurture your customers as much as possible. And when you start to scale, that starts to depreciate a little bit more. And most people are just, they look at Facebook as like, it's like the drug. It's just it's they always want new, 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 and then you forget about your existing customers. And existing customers are way more valuable than new customers, and they're way cheaper to get. So if you can retain your customers, then you can go aggressively after getting new customers. But if you can't retain your new customers, or I'm sorry, if you can't retain your existing customers, you have no business getting new customers. You're just going to keep treading water. And so our retention rate is 20%, which I think is really good. So a fifth of our customers are coming back. Um, they're buying more than once. The mm -hmm. lifetime value that we've calculated is anywhere between seventy and eighty dollars, which is really good. So, those types of metrics are important. And as you grow, you need to segment um, male and female as well. I mean, we saw when we first started out, our brand was heavily male focused. It was like 75, 80 percent male and twenty percent female, and so that was very difficult to to target because men they shop less than women, they only buy black, and <laughs> They, they don't buy very often. And so we started yeah. making products for women and started segmenting our advertising and our content towards women. And we found out that we were able to kind of really tackle and gain some of that market share and just get, get that customer base. And women like more than one pair of sunglasses. They shop more often. They're, you know, they're on social media more. And, and so um, they're looking for more products to purchase. And so we saw a, a heavily increase in um, female uh, customers as well, so that helped kind of segment the gap. And now we're about 60-40, so it's it's been uh, it's been good. Mm, that's that's really interesting. That's an interesting shift for you guys. Um, I want to start to touch base a little bit on because I think this is on everybody's mind: BFCM and Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Uh, for those of you listening and might not 
appreciate them enough, the, the abbreviations, uh, or, or holidays in general, right? So like going into Christmas and Boxing Day. So um, in in the article that was published on the Shopify Plus blog, um, it, there I think was a quote by you saying that people need to be way more ballsy when it comes to their, their BFCM campaigns. I'd, I would love for you to talk about that a little bit. So um, you guys had great results last year. I know you're, you've got like super ambitious plans this year. Um, how do you think about crafting that offer? So yeah, so I mean, I, we kind of break it down. It's like two, th you know, three things. Like make sure whatever you're going, when, when you're going into Black Friday, A, you either have the inventory to liquidate or B, you have all your best sellers in stock and you go deep, deep, deep on those best sellers. And so if you want to crash on Black Friday and if you want to have massive success and you need to take some risks to be able to back up those results and those risks are not easy to take. I mean, we've we've stumbled and we fell on our face multiple times over and we've almost buried the business with or, with over ordering and then under ordering. And so, um, you know, we've kind of been able to, to find that happy medium. But we know that going into Black Friday, we have enough kind of track record to maximize results and maximizing results only comes with deep inventory and for us that's that's everything and because it comes down to what you have in stock and it comes down to um you know getting recouping your cash for pushing you through the next you know three to five months and in the sunglass business it's extremely seasonal even though we're in san diego and it's sunny every day it's like it's a seasonal business it's very seasonal so um it comes down to it all comes out of black friday i mean it's it's the it's it's the Super Bowl for us. <laughs> do you think about Black Friday and Cyber Monday in the same way? Like, is it the same sale? Do you keep it the whole, same thing on all sort of throughout the four days, or do you vary it? So we've done, yeah, so like I'll backtrack a little bit. On 2016, we went into it thinking, okay, cool, we're going to have two different offers. Like, this is, this is what we want. This is what's going to kind of keep the offer fresh, not allow us to provide messages that are going to get numb to our audience, keep things a little bit spicy. We did that. And we had tremendous backlash. I mean, the, the deal on Cyber Monday, because we're e-commerce, was a lot sweeter than Black Friday. And so everybody that bought on Black Friday literally called us, emailed us, and was like, dude, how do you guys do that, blah, blah, blah. And so we had a ton of backlash. And so we went into last year kind of bridging the gap a little bit of the offer. And what our offer was, it was, it was the same on sunglasses and a little bit less or a little bit less on goggles for Black Friday. It was 55% off sunglasses, 30% goggles. Cyber Monday was 55% off and 40% goggles. So we figured with that 10% difference, it wasn't going to be enough of a, of a deal breaker for customers to really come back at us or want a refund or an exchange. And so we saw a heavily increase in our goggle sales on Cyber Monday by just adding that 10% was really able to kind of propel us and kind of finish finish the sale strong. So it comes down to your offer, of course, and it comes down to how you break that offer down and how your customers perceive that offer and kind of weighing all your options when you go into it, you know, and just trying to like look at it from every angle that you can. And it, it just, you know, depending on what, which product you sell, you need to make sure your margins can handle it. Like, you know, deals like we're having and other companies are gonna be different. So. Um, I'm only speaking on behalf of what's worked for us. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, it's like it's a math thing to a degree. Uh, um, but I, so I'm curious as you're as you're kind of like going over the course of sort of the Black Friday Cyber Monday. Um, how much do you guys think about, because I, I would anticipate that you might send out an email, there's a distribution that goes out, uh, and then you probably have X amount of people come to the site and not purchase, um, and then maybe come to the site and like get to check out, but not check out. Um, so how do you think about optimizing through that process and maybe even during that BFCM period, going back and retargeting or like hitting up those merchants again that maybe didn't actually follow through with the purchase? Totally. So in... 2007, I mean, last year, 2017 was the first year that we actually like broke down the e-commerce funnel like entirely and mm -hmm. broke it down to its most like finest form and, and smallest form in terms of like how we're driving traffic and making sure our Facebook ads and the copy and all that stuff was really consistent. We overly went big on content as backup and making sure we had the right inventory to kind of back that up. And then looking at as soon as how are we going to provide value during the, the you know, pre-launch of Black Friday. And so this was our first year where we actually like <clears throat> properly marketed it ahead of time. And we didn't spell out what our offer was going to be, but we figure as soon as November 1st hits, people stop shopping. It's just Black Friday, Black Friday, Black Friday. And so 
your sales just tank. I mean, no matter what, like no one's buying before Black Friday, they're waiting. So we use that time as a way to just get as many eyeballs on blenders as possible, like mm -hmm. whatever that might look like. And we do a $500 gift card spree to our site in for, for shopping as a way to just like get emails, get signups, get people to kind of get, get the word out and get it in people's minds. Because by November, by the middle of November, people have a, their idea or their mind made up of where they're going to shop. And you want to make sure you have inventory in their mind of, of where they're going to shop. So getting your word out ahead of time is important and breaking down your site to its finest form of collection headers to home sliders to, um, you know, how you're going to apply discounts, how you're not going to apply discounts. Um, you know, your checkout banner, you mean the, the biggest things, your abandoned carts, your flows. I mean, we, set up custom flows for literally every single, um, you know, avenue and every single communication line as possible. And to be honest, I think taking pride in every single one of those and breaking those down is the cumulative effect of really like a successful Black Friday. And so the old blenders was just like, oh, shoot, we looked at our watch and the date and it's, it's Black Friday. Let's let's figure it out. You know, and it's like, no, it's full prep mode. It's full like, you know, we, we prepare for a month and we're going in like ready for it. So the preparation is really key and making sure you have all your angles covered in terms of marketing and then I'll, and then we'll go into operations separately because that's a whole other issue. But, um, but yeah, a lot of it's just getting really, really, really granular with all your outlets. Um, I do want to get into the operations side. I have a few more things uh, along the sort of marketing side that a few people have asked here that I'd love to get to. But um, you mentioned start early in terms of marketing for, for Black Friday, Cyber Monday. How early? So is it like, November 1st, the campaign start, is it earlier than that? I mean, if you're starting November, I just think you need to start planning way earlier. So how, how yeah. early is early? So we start about 18 days out and we okay. just kind of just do like, you know, a little countdown and um, we, we do it through Instagram stories. So it's like our organic customer base or our organic followers are seeing this. We don't do it on Facebook. We're not really like blasting sliders and stuff or um, throwing up Facebook ads with like, hey, save, you know, keep us in mind for Black Friday. It's that's all still going in the background, but mm -hmm up to our organic customers and, and our followers there, we start implementing it into, into their minds early on and start driving traffic. And we, we drove like 17,000 signups in that, in that 18 day wow. period for pre pre launch black Friday. And so I don't know how much of those 17,000 people um, purchased, but I would, I would think it had a pretty success, successful uh, conversion rate. So we just go into that just, you know, full on, like, let's get eyeballs on blenders. Let's, let's start getting the word out there and let people know like, Hey, we're going to be a place to shop. And on top of that, you need to have a very compelling offer. Like your offer needs to be very compelling. It needs to be simple. It needs to be easily communicated through your content that you're using, your email messaging, your ad copy. It can't be complicated. I mean, you're competing against every, every big company out there. And so when it's, when you start getting overly complicated with your offer, it's the messaging gets, gets messy. Yeah. Um, so you taught like a big part of the offer is figuring out what the right discounting is going to be, right? Which can be, I think a bit tricky and depends on margins and like all, all the math stuff that needs to go into it. Uh, so one of the questions that came up particularly around sort of BFCM and like creating those offers and those sales is, are you concerned at all? Or do you think about it all? Uh, training people to wait for discounts versus, you know what I'm getting at, versus like actually have them purchase consistently over the course of the year, which if it's a seasonal business is trickier to begin with, right? How do you, how do you think about that? Gosh, that is a slippery slope and every brand has been through this and still goes through it is how do you not do, you know, how do you not train customers for discounts? And so when you're first starting out, like and sales are slow or they're down or your traffic's not, you know, where, where, where you want it to be. What's your, what's your game plan? Oh, let's have a sale. Let's have a sale. And so it's a bad cycle to get into. And, and, but I, we've been victim of it. We have, and we fell into that trap early on. And so we're doing a better job of not trying to undercut our, our sales and making sure when we do a sale, we do a sale properly, not just as like a 20% off or 30% off, like try to mitigate or try to minimize the timeline in which we do sales. And so what, what we found is that if you want to build a brand like that has legs for the future and that can run for a long period of time, like you're going to have to have customers that are loyal and not just loyal by, by price. You have to have that, like I'm shopping with blenders because I love their shades. I love the experience these guys have. And it's in like the price becomes a bonus. So 
for us, that's a huge focus going forward. And to get out of that in the beginning stages is, is very difficult, to be honest. It, it is because you need cash to fund your business. And when you don't have the cash, you do a sale to get people in. So it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing. And people try to, or brands try to go for the quick ROI. They, they try to go for the sale today, but not really think about the implications of what that's going to cause down, down the road. And down the road is where you want to be thinking. The brand yeah, is yeah, so short -term. last over time. Yeah. So short-term impact versus building for the long term and kind of totally. keeping it sustainable. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, I, that's true. I think in every industry, right. It's really easy to just like offer a discount <laughs> um, and drive growth. Uh, so let's touch a little bit um, specifically to uh, the operational side over the course of Black Friday. So I, I'm curious, is Black Friday sort of your biggest day of the year? Like is that or one of your biggest days of the year? Definitely, yeah. Black Friday is by far our, uh, our biggest three to four days of the year by a long shot. Okay, Do you, can you share like how many, how many orders, for example, um, you would be doing in any given period during that time? Yeah, so I mean the orders that we're doing from Thursday, as soon as turkey sliced on Thanksgiving to Tuesday on Cyber Monday extended, that four days, five days is is like 35 to 40,000 orders. And that is a lot of, that is a ton of volume so quickly and influx of customers. So mm -hmm. to be able to sustain that and to fulfill that, like there's a whole laundry list of operational objectives and operational duties that you got to put, you got to put forth. And so, I mean, I can go through some of those definitely on, 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 uh, on what you have to do and what we've learned um, from, from our times, if you, if you want, but it's, yeah, it's good. Yeah, actually, that's, that was kind of where I was going next with this is, how does your business change operationally? Like, I'm sure there are a ton of considerations from like inventory to even staffing. I mean, we've talked to some of our merchants that 10X their staff just to deal with fulfillment um, to all of the other considerations. So can you walk? Walk me through, like, how does your operation actually change during that period and even leading up to that period? Totally. So we've done, we used to do all of our shipping in-house, and we've done that for, that was like the first three to four years. And last year, we've had a fulfillment center for a year and a half, which we finally finally pulled, pulled the trigger on. Um, and so last Black Friday was our first Black Friday with the fulfillment center. And our mindset was like, oh, well, this is what they do. This is this is what they're specialized in. They're, they'll have no problem getting all these orders out. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And so to have a successful Black Friday, I mean, we, we you know, like, like I said, you got to go deep on inventory. You got to tab the inventory to back that up and to actually be able to, per, you know, push the amount of volume that you need to push. Or on the flip side, you need to have a strategy to liquidate inventory to get your cash back. And it's the one time out of the year that you can do that without losing brand integrity. So for us, like making sure your inventory is checked in it's counted for, it's safe, it's, it's literally visible in Shopify is important if you work with a fulfillment center. Um, and then for us having a safe stock, like we had orders coming through so fast, literally at the same exact second that our inventory went negative on like 15 SKUs. So within the first two hours of Black Friday, we had oversells of like 250 and SKUs that went down to zero, people ordered them at the same time, so inventory went negative. So within the first two hours of Black Friday, we now we have massive customer service issues of okay, we have inventory that's negative. So we, we knew, okay, gosh, now this year, provide a safe stock. Now, so going into this, we're gonna have 40, 40 you know, reserves for oversells, for um, exchanges, returns, whatever that might be, to prevent, uh, to prevent going negative again. And on the logistics side, guys, I would say this is probably number one. If you outsource your fulfillment, nothing is worse than having your fulfillment center below it on Black Friday. You do all the work, you put in all the systems, you put in all the marketing, you order all the new products, and then your logistics team blows it and ships your order out 10 days late. And your customers are over the top, livid, mad. A lot of these customers are first time buyers and that's their first experience. And so it's really frustrating because the, you know, when it comes down to that, it's just like, oh man, are you kidding me? So making the expectation clear in terms of what, how many orders you're gonna do on Black Friday and making sure that they have the staff to cover that. And if they don't, then you gotta get ahead of it and see what you can do to kind of help them uh, facilitate this influx of orders. And so it's a lot of work. 
And then you have to schedule out your team. You have to look at, okay, who's going to be around? Who's going on vacation? Who's going to be available? Because it's the holidays, like, you know, and so you can't just put up your sale and have no customer service on the decks to, and expect to do well. Like this is, this is heavily like, you got to be by your phone, your computer. And I've, I've told this to my family. And when you have girlfriends or boyfriends and you don't communicate this, like it, it becomes a massive problem. So uh, be upfront with them and let them know, Hey, it's black Friday. It's the holidays. But when Turkey sliced, it's biz and it's family. So uh, you're going to have to balance both. And, um, be around for that and make sure your customer service team is able to handle any influx of emails, live chat and so, and so forth. And then, um, you know, on the supply side, just make sure you don't run out of supplies. But I would say for us too is um, back on the CS side is managing that all the way through and making sure the sales off the ground, it's working properly. You're, you're rearranging collections as products are selling out. You're responding to DMS as they come in. You're literally at the, at the, the front lines of any communication that comes to the door, you're able to respond to and get people questions quickly. And that's tough when it comes to scheduling out and being able to facilitate that because you need to, you know, it's the holidays and you gotta, you know, you gotta give people their time off as well. So, um, so yeah, but for us, it's, it's held in high regard because we pride ourselves on that. <laughs> Yeah, I, um, one question that, that did come up as well is on the customer success side, particularly on Black Friday, Cyber Monday, what, what are some of the main um, channels that you guys use for CS? So, you know, are you taking phone calls and social? And, like, where do you see the majority of that coming in? Um, and as you mentioned, I mean, for you, it seems like responsiveness is the, is the key. Um, so how do you think about setting that up? Yeah, so I mean, I do a lot of it myself too. I mean, I'm on I'm on my phone, I'm on my laptop, I'm on I'm on live chat, I'm on I'm on Instagram, and a lot of it comes through the ads. You know, when the ads start going out, there's a lot of a lot of questions on the ads, a lot of people tagging their friends, asking, you know, hey, check this out, so and so, and it's just kind of letting people know we're we're also around, and so um, being being responsive is important. And then phones are phones are generally off. I mean, sometimes we'll have, you know, we have a cell phone, so our customer service uh, manager will take it home and, and try to answer calls as she can. But we'll set up a sort of a like a like a voicemail, letting people know, hey, here's our Black Friday schedule, here's Cyber Monday, Happy Holidays. These are our hours of operation. Um, our messaging on live chat has that as well. Emails is is tough because it just comes in so fast. So that's probably the hardest to kind of keep keep track of. But all the front lines, all the social media, all the DMs, all the comments, all the all that stuff is where, um, you know, I like to kind of make sure it's it's all buttoned up. Yeah, no, that that makes a ton of sense. Um, so, shifting a little bit more towards just generally sort of your your website and kind of like the e-commerce experience, um, we had a lot of questions come in around like optimization, right? Um, and sort of optimizing the experience, optimizing the website, check out all of those things. Um, I, I would expect that you guys have probably thought about that and looked about that and gone through many iterations of different different things and trying different things. Um, can you talk a little bit about what um, sort of you've done on the conversion optimization piece that maybe has helped you guys out or how you would recommend uh, merchants start to look at that and think about that and where should they should start from an optimization standpoint? Totally. So it's just simplifying things to, to a T. So it's, it's removing a lot of the bells and whistles of your website and making your, mm -hmm. your user experience really simple and really easy. And so that just comes down to just like consistency and it just comes down to being adamant about um, having the, you know, our, your best selling products in the first row in every collection that, that they're going to be in. Your collection headers are customized for, for whatever collection that, that might be and whatever the offer might be. Um, we're not looking at like the granular, like this button needs to be, or this font needs to be bold versus, you know, italicized or red or blue. Like we're not looking at it at that level. We're looking at it as much more of like, okay, how would we shop if we were looking at this or what's the most important thing in terms of, making the site easy and quick and efficient. And that's just removing a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the clutter and just making it a very easy, simple shopping experience. So just kind of going through the homepage, looking at the homepage, looking at the collection pages, making sure all your best sellers are in the right places, making sure your inventory and your sold out products, you move to the bottom, stuff like that. And just making it very simple is, is our focus. But when it comes to like actual nitty gritty CRO stuff, it's not, it's, it's not something that we're like looking super deep into. Yeah, 
Our, um, lots of questions around, uh, again, back to like marketing growth channels, um, other things that you use. So I'd love to um, understand, you know, are you looking at potentially expanding and leveraging um, other areas of marketing? For example, you know, influencer marketing is like a huge buzzword right now, and you see a lot of people use it. Um, rightly and wrongly in some cases, uh, you know, and, and even going back to more foundational stuff, things like SEO, um, or is that sort of too saturated and too costly to invest in, um, or, you know, even just potentially leveraging other sales channels. So I don't know if you guys use marketplaces, for example, um, to sell through. So how, what are, what are some of those additional areas where you're thinking of maybe investing in, um, from a marketing and growth standpoint? So yeah, we're continuing just to build our online presence as much as possible. I mean, about 97% of our business is done directly through our website. So, yeah. you know, driving traffic in other areas is, is important, but also setting up other revenue streams, you know, um, wholesale is something we're looking into when we first started out, it was very hard for us because it's very capital intensive. And even though it's a very small percentage of our business, it's growing pretty rapidly. So kind of looking at, you know, um, areas where we can kind of grow, grow that way. We're looking at some other sort of like, um, you know, monthly limited edition boxes to kind of spice things up, new product lines. So not so much like diversifying our marketing channels, um, but looking at other revenue streams in terms of like new categories and stuff like that is kind of our focus. Right, right. So what what's your product strategy there? Like, are you um, looking at uh, do, you, do you have a do you have a strategy where you're thinking about we're dropping X new products in X amount of time? These are specifically for wholesale. These are for retail. Are you still sort of trying to figure that out? What does that look like? Yeah. So that's I mean, the product side is always like that's a really fun side, but that's a really challenging side as well. And, uh, you know, as a brand, as, a, as a, an accessory brand in the fashion space, lifestyle space, like it's important to consistently not forget about that. And it's important that that's the stuff that really drives drives the revenue and the sales and bringing out new stuff often is important and it's vital to your success. And so if you don't like designate a lot of time into that and try new things and be um, open to that, then you're gonna kind of pigeon pigeonhole yourself into just being like a, a normal like land brand. And we don't want that. You know, We want a brand that's moving forward. We want a brand that's, um, a little bit unpredictable at times so we can kind of try new things and, and have a little bit more curiosity with our customers. Oh, I wonder what blenders is coming out with next and stuff like that. So we're always going back to the drawing board. We're always trying new things. We're always introducing new products and you can't hit a home run every time we know that. And so we've used to just make stuff that we thought was cool and that we would wear ourselves. And, um, we found out that that's not sometimes the best approach when you're trying to scale. So, yeah. but we also found out that if we, if we order something that, doesn't sell right as long as we get the right content and the creative you know assets behind it we can sell it through through our marketing channels and so content and product are almost hand in hand with 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 your success like if you get the right image and you get the right um, you know creative behind a, pr a certain product and promote it the right way you can sell it so it's understanding that was a huge was a huge factor for us as well Do you think about like physical retail much yeah, we're actually opening up a store. I mean, right now we have a really small office with like 15 people in it and 10 people walking in every single day, literally every day, and we're tucked back in a corner. And so um, it's kind of striked us to, to actually look at our new office as a potential you know, flagship store, and that's definitely our focus. And we're trying to do that right now, and we have it all set up. We're about to move in, but our team is growing so fast that we've already maximized this lease we signed. and. Um, we're trying to scramble and figure out what we're going to do to get to get more space, but it's definitely uh, it's definitely something we're focused on because every customer that comes in literally loves it, and there's like they love seeing the brand first firsthand. They love meeting the team. You know, it's a it's a place they stop at when they come to San Diego. It's like, oh, I had to go to Blenders to get my pair of shades, and then I'm gonna go go get my surf lesson. Like it's kind of become a thing for our customers when they travel and see us. So we want to kind of captivate that in a full kind of retail environment. And uh, that's definitely the plan coming up. Mm, yeah, I, I think that's so fascinating. And I mean, as we start to sort of look at the e-com landscape, we're definitely seeing this blend of online and offline, right? And what does that experience look like? And you know, how do you structure it from a business model perspective where it actually makes a ton of sense for you financially? Um, totally. Super interesting. You'll have to let us know um, when you guys figure that out, and we'll do we'll do another another one of these, and you can talk all about how you went into retail. <laughs> yeah.
so I do have, we do have actually a couple of questions specifically around actually Shopify um, and the platform. Um, so we are going to take a minute to address that. Um, but then I would love to actually flip over into some of the live questions that we have. Um, so hopefully we'll have about 10, 15 minutes to do that. There are a ton of them and I'm loving these questions, guys. Keep them coming. Uh, I am going to try and like group them together a little bit so we're not totally repeating ourselves. Um, but before we go to the live Q&A, uh, Andrew Northrup asks, um, when you guys started off, uh, what did you start on? So his question is, did you start with Shopify Plus um, or did you build your own thing and then move to Shopify Plus? Can you talk a little bit about sort of how you made those decisions and um, sort of what the thought process was when you started and then as you scaled? Shopify for life. We've always been on Shopify and it's been a platform that we've, uh, that we've grown with, that we've been accustomed to since day one. So we don't know any other any other uh, e-commerce platform besides Shopify, and um, there's no there's no point. I mean, Shopify is the best. We love it. We're going to continue to grow with it. And so the way it's been evolving over the years is is hugely valuable for for a scaling business and um, really easy on the team as well. Okay, awesome. Um, I'll I'll just leave it at that. I swear I didn't tell him to say that. <laughs> no. been, uh, that's all. Shopify. Okay. Amazing, amazing. Um, okay, so we are going to run through these questions. Some of them I think are like short and quick answers, um, and we can do a little bit rapid fire side. Some of these look like we're probably going to have to spend a little bit more time on them. Uh, so Justin James asks, um, and I think I know the answer to this because you touched on it, but for Black Friday, uh, AdWords over Facebook ads, which which one wins? Oh, Facebook ads for sure, at least cool. in our experience, yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, Ethan is asking, what methods do you use to liquidate unpopular products? Oh man, that's a good question. So we try to find the black hole. You always want to find the black hole to where you can, you know, dump this and it never sees the face of or the light of day again. <laughs> that's a tough thing to do. And so for us, Black Friday is a way that we can liquidate stuff quickly without having to lose brand integrity. So for us, like, it's really Black Friday. I mean, it's really our own site. Um, and, you know, if, if we'll kind of extend it to our wholesalers as well as, as an option and kind of give them, like, a better deal on it. But liquidating inventory to different areas without knowing where that's going to end up is something you want to be cautious of at, at scale because there are a lot of there's – there's a lot of places you can do it, but you don't want to do it in the wrong place and have it surface in, like, a TJ Maxx or, like, a – a Ross or something and then your brand's just done. You know what I mean? So yeah. be careful about it because and understand where it's going to appear in the next six months or 12 months. Yeah, that's actually a, a really great point because it's tempting to just sell to whoever, particularly if, if it's wholesale, right? Um, okay, Brian would love to know what apps are you using on Shopify? Are there a couple that are just sort of key to your operation? So we use, I mean, for, for customer service, we use Zendesk, which is huge. I mean, our team's big on Zendesk. Um, on the email side and the, you know, the email uh, overlay side and pop-ups and abandoned carts, we use just Uno, which is, which is good. Um, Facebook is shop message, which is really good. It allows us to kind of capture the messaging through Facebook. And we use retention rocket, which is awesome um, for text message stuff. And we use, uh, what else do we use? We use Yapo. Yapo is great. It's, I mean, hugely mm -hmm. valuable when it comes to, getting public credibility and re reviews. And in today's day and age, like companies live and die by reviews. So if you're just starting out on Shopify, I highly suggest making sure you get this implemented into your system right now on day one and start captivating real reviews from real customers. So that allows you to kind of build up over time and provide street credibility. And so, and then we use live chat. I mean, there's, there, it goes on and on. Um, depending on what your needs are, you can shoot me an email and, and I can give you, give you some apps, some more apps, but those are like the top ones. Okay, great. Um, next question is from Raphael. So I'm gonna actually add to this question a little bit. So he says, what states or cities um, do you target and sell in the most? And I, I'm gonna add to that. Um, do you also think about sort of selling globally? And are you guys looking at expanding outside of the states or are you already selling outside of the US? So when, when, we, yeah, so when we first started, we actually became much bigger internationally than domestically. Like we were growing way faster on the international side, but it got messy quick. Like we had no idea what, what we were doing, how to, you know, 
we had troubles trying to set up our U.S. business, yet alone an international business. So um, it got messy quick. And so we just kind of focused on U.S. And it was getting messy just because of, you know, shipping stuff to these other countries at a price point that we're in. It's just it's like shipping stuff to space. It just gets lost. There's taxes. There's all these things that kind of pile on. So the majority of the sales that were international wasn't big enough to justify us like really going all in until mm -hmm. we can find a better like logistics partner and a shipping method. Then we're going to look at marketing it, marketing in other countries. But in terms of, you know, domestically, like our biggest states are, you know, California is number one. I mean, San Diego is massive for us and, you know, California in general and a lot of the sunshine states too, like Texas is really big. New York is really big. Florida is really big. So we've seen a lot of uh, trends in these different areas. And so these are areas that we know um, are coming. And so we're trying to find ways to set up better operational systems in these in these regions to help support that. Okay, great. Great answer. Uh, so Craig is asking, Craig Shapiro wants to know, do you use an external agency for marketing or do you do everything in-house? So we use a handful of different agencies outside. And so we have different email agency, we have a different um, social agency, we have um, you know, other apps and services that we use, but most of the design and stuff kind of all filters from, from in-house. And so we haven't joined or we haven't, you know, partnered with a big agency yet, just in terms of like doing everything, just because we don't, we want people to be specialized in what they do best. And we don't want to kind of get lost in the shuffle of, of these big massive agencies and just kind of be a number in, in their, you know, in their playbook. Like we, we want to be something that they care about. And so we've developed relationships with these agencies over time. And, um, you know, we kind of use them to, to the best of their abilities and what they're best at. And so an area that is difficult with that is just getting all the agencies in all the different areas to connect with each other and to communicate with each other and to sync with each other. Because, you know, if everyone's doing a different thing, how does that all fit into the overall, you know, brand vision and, and cohesiveness to, to your marketing and to your acquisition? It's difficult because they don't all talk to each other, the, the apps don't all work together. And so, that's a, that's a challenge. And so if you're going to do that, you have to have somebody at the helm making sure that they're managing that from top to bottom. Mm, okay. Uh, next question, Catherine. We actually talked about this a little bit before we, um, before we started the AMA. Uh, so when you first started, how big was your team and how many do you have now? <laughs> so when, I, when we first started, we, it was just me and my business partner, uh, Blake, and we literally just did everything ourselves, everything. And it took us forever to hire people. And it's a blessing and a curse at the same time because, you know, on the blessing side, you get to learn all facets of your business. You get to learn all the areas of your business before you hire out for them. And on the cursing side, it's just, you just forget to delegate and you just become accustomed to doing everything yourself and then you, then you don't hire. And so when we started, it was just us. And now, you know, we're getting better at it and we are, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just a single owner now. We're not, we're not, uh, we're not in business anymore together, but, gracious departure, but now it's more so focused on hiring more people. And so our team now is 15 people. And so you, the vision in, in, in your day to day becomes a lot different than what you actually do on a day to day basis. It's not you running around with your head cut off. It's you actually trying to learn how to lead a team, learn how to manage a team, learn how to, um, you know, develop a core group of people and, you know, let them blossom over time and start kind of pulling the strings out a little bit and giving people proper responsibility. And, and that's, for me, that's been a tough thing. That's probably been, for me, the hardest thing in business. I would say leadership, for me, is the most hardest thing in business. And as you scale, especially, it's not complimentary to it whatsoever because you're moving so fast and you, you don't have time to properly train and implement core values and, and um, skills into your employees. And it's, it's, it's hard, it's very difficult. Yeah, I, that is something we hear universally, particularly from people that are sort of in high growth mode like you guys. Um, and uh, and it's, a, it's a completely different skill set. It is a completely different skill set. Um, so a, a couple of people have brought this up. I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, Chase, but uh, a few questions around how often, and I think they're looking for a number here, how often do you release new product designs? I mean, we try to release new stuff all the time. I mean, there's not really like, an exact schedule that we follow. I mean, every month we like to bring out new stuff. And so we see that when we do that, it keeps like, it keeps us in, in it keeps us in the current state of our customers, like best interest, you know, and it, it lets them know that we have good stuff to talk about. We have good stuff. We have good stuff to post about. And so new products really do provide a lot of leverage on that side. And when you don't bring new products, you don't really have much to talk about. So um, new products allow 
a lot of areas for growth in that sense and also allows you to test a lot of things and it shows your customers that you're moving forward and that you're bringing new stuff out and your customers want to see that like they want to see you grow they want to see you bring out new products they want to see your products get better and that's all part of all part of the business and that's all part of building a brand is 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 evolving and so if you're not doing that consistently then it's 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 gonna it's gonna be a detriment for sure yeah um so question just sort of sticking with the product theme i think we can squeeze in like a couple more questions hopefully um how do you deal with product sourcing and quality control mm. issues um i think a lot of people particularly depending on where they're sourcing product from uh this is a challenge for a lot of folks oh my god this is insanely challenging insanely challenging and it has been since day one and it only gets harder um especially as you scale and your orders increase and your po's get larger your supply chain gets more intricate then you start dealing with like excessive you know lead times that are just like over the top long and your quality your quality control and your quality um, level starts to it starts to go down if you don't manage it because you're scaling so fast and you're moving so much product that there's only so much these factories can do and so for us it's just like tight communication I mean we don't we don't have a team on the ground over there like looking at our factories just yet but we're, we're adamantly talking to them every single day we're challenging them every single day we're communicating with them every single day and we're, we're pushing them to a level that is a very high standard and we want we won't let that slip and our goal and our promise is to deliver the best products you know um in the quickest way we can to our customers and continue to move forward and try new things so how you manage that it's just making sure that you you know who's ever at the helm has experience and i advise going over there meeting them face to face and using factories and manufacturing to their best of their abilities because for us, we, we used to just try to run everything through one factory, and that wasn't the smartest move. So diversify your factories, focus on what they're best at, and maximize that. And then that way you're not running all your production through one factory. You can start having multiple factories produce more units for you at a faster rate. Mm, okay. Uh, okay, one more question, uh, and then we're going to wrap things up because Chase is a busy guy. Um, but we'll see if there's a, an easy way for you guys to get the rest of your, your questions answered. Um, so one that actually, as I'm scrolling through all these questions, that seems to be coming up a lot is around influencer marketing and ambassador programs and more sort of that brand side of it. What are your thoughts on that? Is that something you guys do or think about um, or plan to do in any kind of big way? Oh, influencer marketing. Geez, this is a big one. Um, this bubble is just so outrageous and it's about to pop, in my opinion. And it's so like overly competitive and getting overly saturated and, and overly just ridiculous at the same time. I mean, so we've learned, we've ran the gamut on influencer marketing from, you know, your big influencers to your micro influencers and everything in between. And we've seen this space just grow astronomically. We've seen rates go through the roof. So you got to wrestle the fact that if you don't know what you're doing, be very careful, do your homework, make sure you're, make sure you're working with people that resonate with your culture and your core values mm -hmm. and Stop looking at followers, stop looking at likes, start looking at what impact they're having on people and what story they're telling to their customers and how that can attribute to value for you, for your brand and so for your company. So for us, like it's not just like the old days where like, oh, this person has 300,000 followers, let's get them to post about us. It's like, no, like if our glasses don't resonate with that person, then there's no point. For us, it's about like, who do we want to partner with? Who's going to be loyal to us and who can we grow with at the same time? And so we look at this as like a sponsorship. This is a sponsorship. This isn't just like a one and done, one post and that's it. Like, no, we want to build a relationship. We want to build a connection. We want our fans and our customers to be able to buy into them just as much as they buy into us. And the difficult thing with influencers is there is no loyalty. You know, it's always, the grass is always greener and they're always looking for the next best thing. And so do your homework on who they're working with and which brands they're working with and how they're interacting with their audience before you just start throwing money at them because you're going to lose and you're going to fall on your face really fast. So be careful with that. Okay, that's great. Um, I think we're going to end off on that note. Otherwise, we'll be here for another three hours, uh, which is, I think, what we anticipated. Um, Chase, this has been absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you for all of your insight. Uh, we do have a few, few people asking, like, can they email you? How can they contact you? I don't know that we want to necessarily broadcast your email, totally up to you, um, but is there is there a way they can either connect with you on, on social or wherever you're active? Um, and uh, if there's any final words of wisdom you wanna provide? 
Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, feel free to, I mean, you can call into our uh, customers, you know, team and our mermaids, which you like to call them. They'll, they'll gladly kind of send you guys my way. Um, and you can connect with me on Instagram, just chasers, SD, chase Fisher at blenders. I on all pretty much social channels. And yeah, I mean, I just think it's like, don't go for the overnight success guys. I mean, if you're trying to build a brand, if you're trying to start, stop chasing the unicorn, stop chasing the special sauce. There's no one thing that's going to propel you into the future. It's going to be a lot of singles. And that's going to be every single day. So it's just mastering the day to day, getting good at it, learning from your experience and just knowing not to touch the, not to touch the hot stove twice. So, um, so yeah. Fantastic. Great advice. Thank you so much, Chase. Thanks everybody for joining today. Um, once again, please make sure uh, that you keep your eye out on your inbox. Uh, we will be sending the recording over the next couple of days. So you guys can go back, uh, re-listen to some of this stuff because there's lots of really great feedback here um, and great insights here. Uh, so with that, we're going to sign off um, and also keep an eye out for upcoming AMAs over the next couple of months. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye guys. Thank you so much.